you can export SDL files and print the aircraft and just have a look at what they look like. Um, this is what the view looks like on the different platforms. And on the bottom, there is uh, the Android one. It just looks different because it's other. It's, it's different, but um, the back end, the, the computation, the rendering is the same. So you might ask, why do you do, do we want uh, to have an Android port? The DLR, are they the same? Are they We just did it uh, as a fun project, actually, but we just want to share how we did that. So, now let's come to the major topic here in this talk, too, about the hacking. So, about the steps we were going through um, for the report. So, here's a uh, short checklist. What you actually need in order to do this development. So, you need a, of course, Android SDK. And then in addition, you also need the Android native development kit called NDK. And it consists of uh, cross compilers, GCC. It has a build um, tool called NDK Build. It's just based on make files, actually. And it has a debugger based on TDB and, of course, also Android specific libraries to talk to the Android backend, for example, to do some blocking or whatever to remove sensors. And when you want to import uh, third party libraries, you also need of uh, CMake or Woods or whatever this um, third party libraries need. So now I'm going to talk about the steps you're going through when importing the, your code. So first install the SDK and DK, that's obvious. And then, this is quite hard part actually, you have to cross compile all these libraries and your code if you need. And if you're not lucky, then you also have to patch those things. Then if you have that, um, you have to define a Java interface class to talk from Java with the native code, the C++ code. Then you have to write by hand a GNU code in C++, which connects the Java interface and the C++ code. So that's the JNA GNU code. Then you're creating or compiling a shared library, which you can use with your code from Java. And what we did is we designed a Java-based Android user interface, so we have a hybrid application, a user interface in Java and backend in C++, and the Java part talks to the backend, and finally we build the app on higher native code in the standard build steps. And today I'm going to talk about these higher level steps here. So, um, this is just an example of uh, when we imported the OpenScape library, the CAD kernel to Android, and as I already mentioned, it's quite huge, uh, so there were some platform-specific code paths in there. For example, there is a difference in the Android C library compared to the GNU C library. It's the Bionic C, uh, which is part of Android. For example, there's no time zone function. And you, we have to work around that. Also, the password structure, it's a standard structure in the C library, is a bit different. The PWNG host member is just missing, which consists of, which has some user information saved. And uh, more important, uh, the Android kernel don't have the uh, IPC calls, so you don't have calls for shared memory operations. And uh, for these specific uh, methods for releasing and setting semaphores. So we had to find workarounds for that. Um, but what you can do uh, that you're using this if diff statement, you can ask whether you're compiling for Android or for desktop. And on Android, you have this statement underscore Android underscore uh, defined. Um, 
business, so you can just get from the code on which platform you're from. And then we had to deactivate all the X11 server based code path uh, on, on the rendering part of the open escape. Um, since, uh, so what we did actually is just disable the rendering engine completely from OpenSCAD since it uses X11 and the fixed function OpenGL pipeline which we did want to use and replace that with OpenSCAD. So uh, the next step we had to compile that after patching and uh, it's a CMake based uh, tool chain and what you have to do is or what you can do is that you install on your computer a standalone Cross-compiler tool chain um, with the NDK. The NDK has a script, make standalone tool chain, where you just define your target platform, the target directory you want to install it, and then you get a complete standalone tool chain and use that for cross-compilation. And then you're creating a CMake file where you just um, define where your standalone tool chain is located, what your compilers are, and what are these last three lines of code uh, in order that you prevent the compiler using your native libraries and so your desktop libraries and your desktop engines, which should only use these includes and libraries from the native tool chain. And then you're going on, you see make uh, with this tool chain file and then all these little steps are like with standard CMake projects. In the end, you have a shared library with uh, native uh, code for Android or for ARM or whatever. Now, I wanted to talk about like how to speak between these both worlds, the Java world and the native world. And you're using, or we are using the Java native interface for that. Um, which enables us to communicate between these words. And uh, it's realized um, by just calling functions from shared libraries. And on Android, these libraries are the .so files. And JI provides uh, mechanisms uh, to load these shared libraries um, with, with some system calls. And also, it has some functions to convert data types between Java and C. Not so nice is that you have to write the GIMP code for yourself. You cannot do most of it. At least not that easy. Um, what's also important is um, when you define your native interface, um, you really have to be careful of how you call how you name your C functions, GIMP code uh, method names. Um, in order to do that right, you're using the tool Java H, which does it automatically that's kind of nice. And I'm going to show it now how to do that. So first, the first step, you're defining your interface class, and now I'm switching to my Eclipse. Um, I just want to present here a really small, simple app, how to build up such, such communication between uh, Java and the native. So we have here a really simplistic app, just three buttons, and it actually does nothing at the moment. And now I'm, I have here in the JNI folder where I put in my native code. And uh, I created here this whole library, just containing a uh, of three functions, a Fibonacci code, uh, it's recursive defined, so quite computer heavy, not really clever way, but just for demonstration, and to function for setting and getting to think of the library. So this is uh, the C part, and what you have to do now is you define an interface for that, and that consists of two, two steps here. In the first step, you're loading your compiled library in the first step, and in the second step, you define um, your methods you want to talk with. And the important thing is that you call them native, so that 
Java that knows it has to load these methods from the shared library instead of the Java stack. And now I'm going to show you how to do that together. So I'm going to run now um, the Java H command, as I already said. I'm going into the JNI folder and call um, the, the Java H on my Droid Core native class I already made here. I've already done. So what we now see is a refresh. I got a new class or a new header file here. And that's completely uh, created automatically by Java H. And this is um, yeah, the blueprint what we're going to have to implement. And I'm now creating a CPP file with the same name. Um, let's do this. File new um, CPP. And we're including this header file. And we are also including the header file of my library, which I want to use. And now we're going to use some Eclipse magic to implement the implementation for ourselves. So implement method, we're selecting everything and press finish. And now we have the bodies of our functions, we just have to implement them. So then also we have to add this code here to the um, main file. Don't have to forget that in order to be compiled. So and now we want to call, let's, let's, let's go to the first function. We want to call the native Fibonacci computation. So what we just have to do here is we call our library code Fibonacci with the argument n, which we define here. That's everything. Now it's getting a bit more complicated here. The get name function should get a string from C, convert it to Java, and return that to Java as a JavaScript. So what we have to do is, we have to ask the Java native environment to convert as a C string, and we are doing it by using the JNIF object, um, new string UTF will do that for us, and now we just call it again our library, slash get, get name and we are asking for the C spring returning that everything is fine. We can try to compile that. Okay, no errors here, that's good. So let's come to the uh, last method here. Here we put in vice versa, so we get a string from Java, I have to convert it to C spring and give that to our library. So first we need a, um, let's call that here the, the name. And we also need the environment again. So we have our uh, C string. And we are recalling, um, we are using the function get string um, UTF characters which transforms the, the Java string name into the C string C in STR. With this string we can call uh, our library um, set name C string and now we're not ready since we have to release this uh, C string again. C is a bit messy, we have to do uh, the memory management by ourselves so we have to do that here. If the deallocate the C string and we are not allowed to use delete, but we have to use a function from the JNI environment, which is called C string release UTF characters. And as an argument, we give the Java string and the C string, and that's, that should be it. So, what I did now is I just coupled the Java code and the C code. And now I just have to uh, call this code from the Java inside. So for now, we, I'm just uh, calling on the emulator, um, running this code that we already have. Um, so now 
now for now it just don't do anything. So it just say okay I press on one of these buttons, nothing fancy and we want to connect that. We are going to our uh, activity and just call C functions as normal Java functions. So um, what we are doing here is we store the result of Fibonacci droid com native dot um, Fibonacci number M and save that into the text here at the top. Set text integer value of result. So now we uh, can display the computation of the Fibonacci code in uh, the view. And we're doing the same here also for the set and get name functions. So, um, Droid connect get name will give us a string. Displaying that on this text view um, name. And finally, with the set name, we are just taking the text out of the text box and giving it to the native code. So, um, Droid on native set name um, text dot So now, our app is ready to be called. Let's have a look. So what you are seeing is now I can enter here some numbers and Fibonacci code should be called. You can feel that okay, 10 Fibonacci numbers, 89. Let's go up a bit, 35. And there, there we are. So it's quite fast. Okay, if you go up with this number here, if you go up to 50, then it will compute quite long since it's a recursive operation. You have this tree, uh, but just for demonstration. So that works. Just call get name, and there, this is the library just returns default name now. And I can change that by entering hi droid com community. Oh, I'm setting the name. And if I'm pressing get name, it should get that there. So, I used to this demonstration, and um, now I'm coming to a part uh, which is quite important. Uh, it's about the life cycle of uh, native code, and it's different uh, from what you have uh, the Java code. So, we're skipping this. I already did that here in the tutorial. So you probably know that an Android app has several steps in life cycle. So you have different, different states, started, resume, pause, stop, created, whatever. These steps don't exist in the native code. There is just one, or there are just two steps actually, um, not loaded and loaded. So when before your library gets loaded and after. And um, your native library recites the memory if you close your app. So it remains the state, and that's quite important. You have to be careful when uh, dealing with that. And in order to show you what I mean, just go to the emulator break. So I'm just closing the app here. You can see uh, at the bottom there is still the hydroelectric community and the 35 inserted in here. And if I go in, like everything is set, reset. But now, if I press get name, Saloni Hydroid Hub community is still there. And that also works if I'm uh, suspending my device and um, go back again suspending. Uh, let's have a look what's happening if we uh, get the game. Still Hydroid Hub community. The only way to reset for now the app is to completely kill it. And if I now press get name, get the default name. So if you don't want this behavior, you have to write it by yourself. You have to call some cleanup functions uh, from your Java code to the So some words about compiling and packaging when you have uh, native code. And it's just about uh, how to integrate APK build 
into the greater root system, which is the new root system for Android, which it replaces Apache and it's already used by Android Studio. But the NDK integration into Gradle is just integrated recently by Google and it tries to create the main files by its own, which mostly didn't work or don't work. So as a workaround, you can disable the automatic creation of Android main files. You write your own main files as I showed before, shortly and you have to define a custom build task in order that you run the NDK build command, else you won't get your library and you probably get some crash. And this is how you do that. So you have to register your libs folder inside your app uh, source folder. Um, that this libs folder gets included into the APK file. And you're defining the chain I source gives variable in the setting it just to zero. With that, you prevent automatic main file creation. Then you define a custom build task. So you just say, okay, please call NDK build command, and you just decide whether you're using Windows or not. You have to use different NDK build commands. And what you can also do is you're providing the minus J uh, argument for NDK, which allows you to do parallel views. So you can make up the build much faster and runtime available processes gives you uh, yeah, the number of processes in your computer and if you have all then you're compiling for CPP files at one time. And finally you just have to add this newly this newly created task um, to to the compiled tasks or that Gradle knows okay I have to call that before packaging everything. My almost last slide here is about using an emulator efficiently. I have already showed you with that simple example um, an emulator. The problem is that the standard Android virtual device is pretty slow since uh, it emulates ARM instructions using the QAMU software. And if you have a CPU hungry uh, apps, then it's gets really, really slow and painful. What you can do, and what we heard about before, is you can uh, switch to an x 86 based um, emulator with GPU acceleration. And you only have to do this um, use or install the Intel HAXM acceleration driver, which is part of the Android SDK. Then, of course, you have to recompile your third-party libraries um, with an x86 based toolchain, you cannot use your compiled ARM code, of course. And you have to add the x86 to your application MK, which is in the JNI folder. So, in addition to the ARM EAVI, you also have x86, and then you get for both of those your compiled code. And this is then how it looks like. Now I'm trying to run uh, the actual application we imported here, which is that one. And uh, you see this is the, the graphical view. And now I'm gonna load some airplane, which is computed on time here. It's, it's, you really you see a kernel is working now. And there we are. So it's pretty fast and performant. You can you select everything, you have animations, whatever you want. So there's a really good way um, to use the emulator. Okay, and as you probably have seen, that was not a standard uh, emulator, it was the Jetty Motion Android emulator, which is also x86 based. And for me at least, it works much better than the standard emulator. It uses virtual box under the hood and comes with many pre-configured devices and for me it just works and this is how it looks like. Um, the app is in store since Monday, I think. For free, of course, it's a really small app, but uh, yeah, you might check that out and give us some feedback what you think about that. Um, we will be glad. 
So, um, yeah, do you have any questions? Just for important remark, uh, you can write me um, email and the sample code what we did here, what I did here now, is also on GitHub if you want to check that out.